My father always said when, he, when anyone tried to um, compliment him and tell him what a great guy he was and all his accomplishments, he would always say, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We do. If you come from a godly home, there is a rich heritage, very often material things as well as spiritual things. And you come in and you inherit this, watch yourself that you forget the Lord. Welcome to the Basic Training Podcast. This is a weekly live recording of a course led by Dr. Robert Forney to several men at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. The main topic of this course is how to be a man of God in today's society. Welcome to the Basic Training uh, Podcast. This is episode number 11. Pedagogy is a interesting term. I had a discussion recently with my son-in-law about this because he's uh, taking pedagogy. This, this word is derived from a Greek word, pedagogus, which has two parts. The first is ego, which means I lead, and pedos, which means child. Like pediatrics is medicine for children, so it's the same idea. So I lead child, or in other words, pedagogy is to lead a child. It's commonly understood as an approach to teaching that broadly refers to both theory and practice and how the, this influences the growth of the learner. It's really about shaping someone's lives more than just providing information. There's an interesting story about an English poet who was a, a Christian. It's named Samuel Coleridge. He was, uh, he was born in 1772 and died in 1834. Uh, he was a friend of William Wordsworth and was a, a very influential. Uh, his father was a pastor. Anyway, he had a dinner guest once who was an atheist. And during the meal, his guest expounded the virtues of freedom of choice and how religion prevented people from being truly free. He was especially upset with how parents train their children in the faith, claiming the kids should be free to believe what they want without any outside influence from their parents. In other words, no pedagogy. After dinner, Coleridge got up and asked his friend to come outside with him to take a look at his garden. Coleridge was known as an expert gardener, so his guest was expecting to see beautiful flowers, sculpted shrubbery, and flowering plants. Instead, he saw weeds everywhere, and out-of-control vines and general disorder. Everything was overgrown. The atheist looked puzzled and said, This is your garden? What happened? Coolridge responded, Well, I just took your advice. I wouldn't want to impose myself on these young vines. I just let them grow like they wanted to. So, men... What kind of garden are you growing in your home? Galatians, Paul tells us in chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So God is not mocked. What we plant, what we take care of, that's what we reap. Men, have your home so full of the word of God that your children can't help but see and hear it wherever they go, and whatever they do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would instruct us through your word that we might be uh, fathers that bring glory to your son Jesus and who raise godly seed in our sons and our daughters. We thank you for our families, for our wives. Bless our time together in the word. 
uh, this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm entitling this, A Father's Magna Carta. Now, Magna Carta was a historical document. What it means in English is the Great Charter. So this is the Father's Great Charter. A charter is a written grant by a sovereign power by which an institution is created and its rights and privileges are defined. We have in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, are the Christians' Magna Carta. And especially when we get to chapter 6, which we will in a little bit, we have a singular passage that is foundation for all of our considerations of fatherhood that will follow. First, a little bit of background about Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy was spoken by Moses on the plains of Moab just before the people of Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, go into the Promised Land across the Jordan River. God had prevented Moses from going into the Promised Land because of his sin in losing his temper. But the book of Deuteronomy can is largely composed of three sermons. Moses preaches three sermons to the people, and then at the end of the three sermons, we have in chapter 32 an amazing passage called the Song of Moses. And in the song, Moses extols God's graciousness and reminds his people of their irresponsibility to the covenant on their journey from Egypt to, to Moab. The first sermon Moses recounts the history of God's gracious guidance of them from Horeb, from Mount Sinai, to Moab, to that point. In the second sermon, beginning in chapter 5, the first sermon being chapters 1 through 4, the second sermon, uh, he provides laws to live by. And that takes really most of the book, chapter 5 through 26. In the third sermon, he then speaks warnings and gives predictions about Israel's future. The final end of the book, before the account of his death, his death is accounted in chapter 34, but the end of Moses' speaking is in chapter 33. In the last verse, he blesses Israel. Even though he's recounted all their failures, he blesses them. As fathers, we should be a blessing to all of our children. And this is what Moses says. He says, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord? Who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty? So your enemies shall cringe before you, and you shall tread upon their high places. And so this is an optimistic Moses. And as dads, because of the Holy Spirit, because uh, Jesus is our head, we should be optimistic. And whatever instruction we have for our sons and daughters should never be so harsh or so pessimistic or so cutting down. Even though we have hard things that we need to say, we should do it with a heart that is optimistic because God is alive. So I'd like to share with you part of Deuteronomy chapter 4 before we get to chapter 6. Now, you recall I just said this would be near the end of the first sermon chapter 4 being that end. But I'm just going to uh, read the first 14 verses and comment on them briefly. So Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 14. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am te teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord your God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who follow Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who hold fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him, 
Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently, so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire to the very heart of the heavens, darkness, cloud, and thick gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments, that you might perform them in the land where you are going over to possess it. This is the word of the Lord. So, there's a lot here. Uh, I just want to comment on a few things. You notice Moses' passion that he is urging. He says, now, O Israel, listen. He's, he really cares about this. You know, I think, I think our sons and our daughters can tell when we're telling them something that we feel is really important. They can hear it in the tone of our voice. They can hear it in the, the words that we say. And I'm sorry to say that many, many men in the church today don't have this kind of a voice with their, with their children. Your sons and your daughters should know how important the statutes and the judgments of the Lord are. They should also know that you fear the Lord and that you want to teach them. And here's, here's a real big thing. Teach them not as they are the end point, but prepare them to teach your grandchildren. You're teaching teachers to teach rather than just merely teaching your, uh, your children. He says this, assemble the people to me that I may let them hear my words so they may learn to fear me all the days they live on earth and that they may teach their children. And so this is the way we are to, to be fathers, and that is to father future fathers you know, to, to train them how to be a dad that is pleasing to the Lord. He said, listen to the statutes and judgments I'm teaching you to perform so that. So there's a purpose for Moses' teaching and for our teaching. And that purpose is, so you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, is giving to you. So we don't have property in the Middle East that we're bequeathing to our sons. But the land in this instance is a type of the future, of God's will for their lives, that we want them to go in and possess that which God is calling them to. And so we teach the statutes and judgments of the Lord so they may do that. The result of this is the nations around Israel would say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. This is a very important point. We're talking about wisdom and understanding. We're not talking about browbeating our children. The statutes and judgments of the Lord are that which brings wisdom, that they may know how to discern right from wrong, but also discern good from evil and profit from folly. And this type of discernment, especially today when we live in a nation that is so foolish, that makes so many bad choices, this certainly is an opportunity to glorify the Lord. So this hearing, this teaching is done not in a corner, but it is done in full view of witnesses, the witnesses being the, the brothers and sisters of our children the witnesses being neighbors who might be present, the witnesses being our wives and our own parents. This, this is not to be done in a, in a very private way. And finally, Moses did what God commanded him to do. And men, God has commanded us 
to teach our children as well. And so we are to obey the Lord if we expect our children to obey the Lord as well. He says to Israel, he says, consider your position. He says, they're a great nation. Now, there, were, there was much disobedience in them that he had outlined in the chapters one through three, the grumblings and the shirkings and the refusing to go into the land when he was led into the land. And yet Moses says, they're a great nation. Why are they a great nation? Because God is so near that they can call on him and he answers. Consider your position. What a great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I am setting before you today. And so our families are great families. They're great families because God is near and answers when we pray. They're great families because the families of this world don't have the statutes and judgments and the wisdom of the Lord that we possess and that we are to make known to our sons and our grandsons. Sadly, after Moses' sermon, uh, after they enter the land, when that generation who heard Moses' words died, they did not teach their sons and grandsons. And we read this in the second chapter of Judges, starting at verse 8. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnah Herez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. And so this generation listening to Moses failed to teach their sons. Men, let's not be that generation. And so we come to what I'm calling a father's Magna Carta, Deuteronomy chapter 6, the entire chapter. I'm going to read it in sections and talk about each section as we go along. First of all, the first nine verses. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is a great word of the Lord. So Moses says, these are the commands, the decrees, and laws the Lord your God has directed me to teach you to observe. Why? So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live. So we teach for the purpose of impressing upon our children and their children after them a fear of the Lord. Now, some have said, well, fear of the Lord, that just means great respect. No, it means fear. Remember in chapter 4 when he recounted the fire coming from Mount Sinai and how they couldn't see God's form and how they only heard his voice and they trembled. It was real fear. To know that God exists and that he holds us accountable and that he blesses us in a mighty way produces much more than just respect. It produces fear. And the question is, what does Moses say, what does the Holy Spirit say, characterizes 
this fear, that you may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you. When we fear God, we obey him. Children who are not disciplined don't fear their father, and they don't obey. When we don't obey God, we are teaching our kids not to fear God. But there's another reason. We, we fear the Lord by keeping his commands, but he says a couple of things, what the purpose of this is, so that you may enjoy long life. So God's purpose in our fearing him is for our benefit, even for our pleasure and for our longevity, that you may have long life and that you may enjoy a long life. It's for joy. He goes on and says, Hero is be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly. So long life, joy, going well, and increasing, being productive in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. So God has this tremendous gift he wants to give to us, tremendous blessings. But the way in which we acquire these blessings are to fear him by keeping his commandments. And then in verse 4, we have one of the truly great uh, verses or two verses uh, in all of Scripture. As a matter of fact, in the Jewish faith, this is where fathers begin to teach their children. The first thing they teach them is Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And this is how it goes in Hebrew. And this was what a father says. And as he says this, the scriptures are opened and the father holds the hand of the child and with the pointer finger pointing to each word as the father reads the words, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema means here. And this verse is called the big Shema. You talk to a Jewish person, you say, you know the Shema, and they'll, they'll know what you're talking about if they've had any instruction. Shema Yisrael, well, that's Israel. And then something very strange. And in the handout, if you download it or if you, you have it there, I've reproduced the Hebrew and the English underneath it. The actual word, the third word in this uh, verse, is the word Yahweh, which is the personal name of God. So the verse should read, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah is our God. Jehovah is one. Okay, and this is the personal name revealed to Moses at the burning bush of God. I am that I am would be a translation of it. But the Jews so reverence the name of God that they don't pronounce it. So in the scriptures where it says Yahweh, they say Adonai, which means Lord. So here, Israel, Lord our God, Lord is one. But uh, I commend this to you. I even commend that you learn to say this in English and teach the actual Hebrew words to your sons and daughters. The second verse, and you shall love the Lord your God, and you shall love Yahweh your God, or you shall love Jehovah your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So the heart of the matter, we're to love with our heart, and the commandments are to be on our heart. If we, if we love someone with our heart, then their words will also be on our heart, and also their image will be uh, in our heart. Now, I, I said in a previous podcast, the way the Old Testament ends is a warning that God will send Elijah to restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And this absence of fatherhood, the absence of, 
of sons that have the hearts of their fathers and who have given their hearts to their fathers is the big problem. It's the same with the Lord. We are to have his heart. We have his heart. He gives his heart to us. He wants us to give our heart to him. And so we should love Yahweh, our God, with, with our hearts, with all our hearts. And, the, and therefore, his commandments should be on our hearts. And if they are on our hearts, then we are to impress them on our children. Those who are not impressing the commandments of the Lord on their children, is it not because those commandments are not on their hearts? And in fact, that the love of the Lord is not on their hearts. This is, this is why I say this is the Magna Carta. It's the charter. It's the covenant that extends enjoying long life, doing well, and increasing greatly. And it's based on our loving the Lord and teaching his commandments. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. So whether you're, whether you're sitting or moving, they're to be spoken of. We are to be using everyday situations and applying God's word to it so that our, our sons and our daughters read the word, they memorize the word, they know the word, but they, they have fathers who apply it to them uh, in everyday life, whether that is out on the road or whether it's at home when you lie down and when you get up. So whether we're morning or night, in other words, this is to be an extensive impressing the commandments on the children. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. The Jews, uh, Orthodox Jews, do this literally. They're called phylacteries. They have a little box with straps and they tie it on, the, the men tie it on their heads and this little box with the Ten Commandments in it is uh, protruding out of their uh, on their forehead, and they have uh, these straps that they wind around their their hands and their wrists that have uh, the law on it as well. I don't believe that we are to be doing this. Instead, what our hands do and what our minds engage in should be fulfillment of the commandments of the Lord. Others should look at our hands and at our minds and, and the things that we set our minds to do and see the righteousness of God in it. He says, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Well, this means that our homes are to be symbols of the righteousness of God. Now, we have done this. I started it, and my when I got married, my wife uh, joyfully continued it. We've literally done this part. We have scripture hanging on the walls in many different rooms. And in fact, when the house was being built, before I moved in, before the painters painted or the wallpaper people put wallpaper up, I wrote verses all over the walls, all over this house. And in fact, I invited many of my friends to do, to do the same. In fact, uh, my wife, Debbie, we, we were dating at that time. She wrote words. And I tried to match the words of Scripture to the purpose of the room in which they were being written. Uh, my wife at a dressing table in uh, the master suite wrote verses about vanity and about not being vain. In our dining room, we wrote verses about hospitality. The family room where I led a Bible study, uh, I, I wrote verses about the Word of God and so on. Uh, whether you do this and then paint over it as I did, it was very interesting conversations, by the way, that I had with the painters and with the wallpaper people. They thought it was really weird. And some of the, some of the writings that some of the people had done were spectacular in their beauty. You know, and this guy called me and said, you really want me to paint over this? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, those words are there. You know, And uh, of course, I took pictures before they were painted uh, to preserve. But whether you do that or whether you find other ways, 
you know, uh, kids like to put things on the refrigerator. They draw things. Well, how about the Word of God? You know, how about putting the Word of God, making making these yourself, or you can buy them at uh, at bookstores. Anyway, uh, everything we can do to remind us of God's wisdom, and especially as we can make it appropriate to the activities in which we're engaged in. And by having these things spoken of all the time, written on door frames of the houses and the gates, uh, this means that guests, neighbors and guests, will also be exposed to the Word of God. And that's the way it should be. I challenge you, man, when's the last time anyone not connected with your church or your family heard or saw the Word of God as they uh, were in your home? That it should be that they should always uh, encounter this. Moving on to uh, verses 10 through 15. So after all of this, loving the Lord with all our heart and, and mind and strength, doing the commandments, impressing them on our children, talking of them, whatever, it says that in verse 10, then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you shall eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. And so, there's a result the result of these commandments. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build and houses full of all good things which you didn't fill and hewn cisterns which you didn't dig, vineyards and olive trees which you didn't plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself that you forget the Lord. Okay, guys, this is the way it is. When I was a young man, I was like every other young man. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a career. I didn't have a life, really. I wanted these things. I saw older people who had these things, and I said, will this ever happen to me? Now, I didn't marry until I was 41, so I had a long time to be worried about this. But this is, this is very typical for young men, if they're honest, that they are, there is a, a certain worry uh, and anxiety about this. And sometimes this is a time of very active spiritual activity. There's a lot of prayer. There's a lot of uh, asking God they're seeking wisdom, whatever. And then God brings us into the land, and he gives us that which he wants us to have, that which we've been looking for. And so many times, I can't tell you over the years, my wife and I have had a Bible study in our home that was had a large number of single people. And boy, they were very spiritual until they got married. And then they got married, and all of a sudden, it wasn't that big a deal anymore. They got what they wanted, and it seemingly forgot the Lord. Now, I always said they didn't have to come to our Bible study to be spiritual. So it's not just that they disappeared from the Bible study, but too many of them disappeared entirely. And later, they turn up, and you see that they've been divorced that they've fallen completely away from the Lord, and this is what happens. You know, we pray, we're on a journey, we're longing for something, and then God gives it to us, and then there's this temptation to forget. And so Moses says, watch yourselves 
that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So watch yourselves. But men, impress on your sons that your sons watch themselves and that they teach your grandsons to watch themselves. You know, we inherit. My father always said when, he, when anyone tried to compliment him and tell him what a great guy he was and all his accomplishments, he would always say, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We do. If you come from a godly home, there is a rich heritage, very often material things as well as spiritual things. And you come in and you inherit this, watch yourself that you forget the Lord. Uh, you shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. Well, that's what happens when you forget the Lord. You become a pagan. Your, your tastes go to the tastes of those around you. Your hearts go to the hearts of those around you, and they leave the Lord. The next section follows on this. He says, "You shall not, starting at verse 16, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. You should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to your fathers, driving out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. And so, what is this putting the Lord God to the test? Now, it's very interesting. The Lord God puts us to the test. That is okay. He is our God, but we do not test him. We do not say to God, you know, I will believe in you if, you know, what are you doing for me now? I don't, you know, I don't, I don't trust you anymore because of the hardship that I'm, I'm experiencing. This is testing God. What we're saying to God is you haven't done enough. You know, you've, you did some things in the past, but the, it's not enough. And I am justified in being upset. And the people grumbled. And their grumbling was displeasing to God, who was gracious, who had, as Moses said in chapter 4, what, what great nation has a God who is so near, has a God who answers prayer, has a God who guides them and, and gives them good things? We do not put him to the test. And uh, we need to impress our sons not to put God to the test. You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you. There's pleasure in sin in the short run. But to prosper, not in the sense of becoming wealthy, but to, to have our souls prosper, to, be, to have it be well with us, we must do what is right and good, because sin finds its way in us. Wages of sin is death. And those who sin continually are are destroying their own lives. But to be well and healthy, to be like a well-tended garden, we need to do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. And for that, we need the statutes and judgments, that it may be well with you and that you go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers by driving out all your enemies before you as the Lord has spoken. Men, we have enemies. Our sons have enemies. Our grandsons will have enemies enemies. How do we have victory over our enemies? By doing the statutes and judgments of the Lord. Then he will drive them out. Then we may go in and possess the good land that he is preparing for us, that he has swore to our fathers to give us. In verse 20, we come to the follow-up of this. So this is really what I've just said is the foundation. It's the heart of the instructions of fathers, first instructing fathers ourselves, we ourselves, and then the, the bedrock foundation of what we're to instruct our sons. And then in verse 20, it switches to our son's son. He says, when your son asks you in time to come, what do the testimonies and statutes and judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you. It's very interesting. 
when your son asks you in time to come, what do the testimonies and statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? First of all, notice that the son is asking about the commands that the Lord has commanded the father and not he himself, the son. Secondly, Moses says there'll come a time when the son will want to ask what these testimonies and statutes and judgments mean. What that means is that the son has heard the testimony, statutes, and judgments before he understands them. And so this time comes to those who are faithful to this calling, to this duty of fatherhood, to teach our sons, that we're to do that when they're too young to un even understand what they mean. But the day comes when they do understand what they mean, and the from the son's perspective, the son has not yet made them his own, and he's asking about, really, about the father's faith in God and the statutes and judgments that the father believes and is, is following. Well, Moses says, then you shall say to your son, when this day comes, this is what we are to say to this son who's asking what they mean to us. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he commanded us. What do they mean? Well, first of all, they mean salvation. And Moses instructed the fathers to say that the Lord brought us out with a mighty hand. In other words, the salvation was not an easy or a cheap thing. In fact, it cost the life of his only begotten son. It was a death on the cross and the resurrection. It took a mighty act of God to deliver us. And as being delivered, we are to love the God who delivered us and his statutes and judgments. Moreover, not only did the Lord save us, moreover, the Lord showed great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt. This is the fear part. They saw how God treated the Egyptians. At the same time, he was treating them with salvation. I often think of the time when the angel of death went through the land of Egypt, through Goshen, where Israel was. And those who were, had obeyed God and were in the house and eating the Passover lamb and had marked the, the door, uh, the doorposts and the lentil with the blood, that while Israel was celebrating a feast, outside there was death, outside the kingdom, outside of these homes. Did you think of the doorposts and lentil of Passover when, in just a few verses before, God said, write them on the doorposts and gates of your house? This is a similar command to putting the blood on the, the doorposts and gates. And so there's this mighty hand of deliverance and this awesome display of fear. He calls it distressing signs and wonders. You know, as all the Egyptian firstborn were killed, knowing that he saved us, not just for salvation's sake, but in order to give us something that he had promised to bring us in and give us the land. So the Lord commanded these statutes and judgments to fear him for our survival as it is to this day. And so what is this all about? Well, it's about survival. It's about blessing. It's about enjoying the goodness of God and the good life. It's about being well with us. It's, it's about being fruitful and all these good things that will come from this. 
you've heard of four spiritual laws. Well, here's, here's Moses' four spiritual laws. Teach and explain to the son the fear. Explain. One, we were slaves. Two, the Lord saved us with a mighty hand. Three, he brought us out. He did, just didn't save them, but he took them out of Egypt. Four, he brought us in. He took us out to bring us in. And so the Lord commanded that we fear and obey him for our good and survival and for our righteousness. Well, this is a great passage, and it's worth going over it with your children. I, I think you might enjoy learning to say the Shema in, in Hebrew, and thereby connecting yourself with God's people through the ages, who still uh, love this verse. But I want to tell you uh, a few more things. Paul tells us in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, at verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. What is the purpose of our fatherhood and of our instruction? It's to raise men. There are so many men today that even though they're in their 30s or 40s, they're, they're children. They have childish ways. They talk like children. They think like children. They act like children. They reason like children. They're not men. Men, we must put away childish ways, as Paul said. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And so we must. And it's through this basic instruction. Now, I have much more to say. We've got six or seven more uh, podcasts in, in fatherhood where we're going to talk about more details. But this is really the foundation of this. It's becoming a man is what, what we're talking about. On that subject, from my father and from, from a man named J. Oswald Sanders, who wrote a great book that I commend to you called Spiritual Leadership, I myself have given this book out to many men over the years. Sanders was director of Overseas Missionary Fellowship, which at the beginning was called China Inland Mission. He was a missionary. This was in the 1950s and 60s. He was from New Zealand, and he left a promising law practice to become a director of this mission and also later a Bible, the administrator of a Bible college in New Zealand. And anyway, in Spiritual Leadership, which was printed in first edition in 1967, he made a list of, of leadership qualities, but I would call them manly qualities. And so as we think about Deuteronomy 6 and anticipate the additional lessons to come, I want to, I want to list a number of these qualities. There's a total of uh, 11 of them. You might say there's not a hierarchy here. It's, it's not uh, you do this and then later do that. It's really all of these that need to be uh, incorporated together. Number one, prudence. Prudence is wisdom. That's what we've just been speaking, that we might have be wise and have understanding that the nations around us might marvel at our understanding and our wisdom. Wisdom makes use of knowledge with discernment and with wise judgment. It rightly divides scripture and applies it to our lives and to situations. It does not merely look for the eminence of God or God's coziness, but also for his transcendence, that is, God's otherness as he transcends from the spiritual realm into the human realm. So wisdom, prudence. Number two, fortitude. Prudence and fortitude. Fortitude is courage. It's a quality which enables men to encounter danger or difficulty with firmness, without fear or depression in their spirit. My dad impressed on me prudence and fortitude and that these two go together. He said, 
if you can keep your head while those around you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, this keeping your head and being wise in, in spite of stress, especially the stress of apparent failure, if you can keep your head, and then fortitude is the courage to actually act and not be paralyzed or not shrink from the task at hand, to not abandon it. And then number three, charity or love affectionate and loyal friend of God and man. This is what a man is. So lover of God, passionate about the things of the Lord, honoring the Sabbath, honoring parents, honoring leaders. Also a lover of men with a large capacity for friendship and service to other men, able to draw out the best in others. All godly men have big hearts. A godly man is a lover. He's a lover of his wife, a lover of his children, a lover of the people in the church, and a lover of even his enemies. Four, discipline. A disciplined man works while others waste time, studies while others sleep, prays while others play. No loose or slovenly habit in word, thought, deed, or dress. Soldierly discipline in diet and deportment. Deportment is the way we present ourselves to others. Someone who stands with his shoulders back and stands erect, who has a firm hand grip and looks in the eye of the person he's speaking to, undertakes without reluctance, unpleasant tasks which others avoid or hidden duties others avoid because they evoke no applause or win no approval. Undertakes without reluctance. This is discipline. Unpleasant tasks, things that are necessary. Does not shirk from facing difficult people or situations. He's kindly and courageously rebukes and administers discipline where it's called for does not procrastinate, is willing to give to others and receive from others. All this is discipline. Five, vision. He sees more and further than others. He gains insight into spiritual things. He visualizes the future with optimism and hope. A pessimist sees difficulties in opportunities. But the godly man, because God is near, because God leads, because God answers prayer, is optimistic and hopeful. He's realistic and cautious because he's prudent, but he is not overly cautious. Six, decisiveness. He makes clear decisions when all the facts are in. He bases these decisions on sound premises. In other words, there's a good reason for him to make the decision that he makes. Once he's sure of God's will, he goes into immediate action on God's will. All the men of faith in Hebrews 11 were men of vision and decisiveness. Seven, humility. Self-effacement, not self-advertisement. He doesn't put on social media the great things he is doing. He's not pompous or overbearing. He chooses the hidden pathway of sacrificial service and the approval of God rather than seeking the applause of men. He must increase, but I must decrease, is what John the Baptist said. This is humility. A humble man will express his humility by being willingly, even gladly, to work faithfully behind the scenes. Doesn't have to be out front. Eight, integrity. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity we speak of Christ in the sight of God. In other words, he has integrity. They're not doing it for sordid gain. In 2 Timothy, we serve God with a clear conscience. This is integrity. He's sincere in his promises, faithful in the discharge of his duties, upright in his finances, loyal in service, honest in his speech. What he says, he does. Nine, patience. 
the patient man is constant under trial. He's steadfastly accepting everything life brings, forbearing with a young believer or with a slow learner. He's patient, not losing his temper in the face of the innate perversity of inanimate objects. My dad would always laugh when things broke, and he'd shake his head and he'd remind me that inanimate objects are perverse, you know, and I'd laugh with him, uh, you know, or if if a tool would break and maybe it would cut him or me, he'd shake his head and say, he'd laugh and say the innate perversity, we're not going to let it get us down, are we? We're better than that. We need to call our sons to be patient. 10, tact and diplomacy. You know what tact is. When we're tactful, we're not, uh, we're not irritating to others needlessly. Tact actually has to do with a sense of touch. It means that we have some feelings and we have respect for the feelings of others. And diplomacy is not hiding the truth, but rather presenting the truth in a way that it can be understood and accepted. It's a skill in dealing with people, especially in sensitive situations. It's an intuitive perception a fine perception of what is fit, proper, and right to do and say. Scripture is full of examples of this and instructions on how to do it. It's dexterity and skill in managing affairs of any kind. It's a combination, skill in reconciling opposing viewpoints without giving offense and yet without compromising fundamental principles. It's a conduct of delicate negotiations and matters, recognizing others' individual rights, searching for and leading to a harmonious solution without compromise. This is, this is the kind of wisdom that we gain as we study Scripture and as we teach it and as we let the Holy Spirit guide us. Okay, and the last attribute of a godly man from this book on spiritual leadership that I want to present to you is inspirational power, the ability to inspire others to service and sacrifice. Men who are full of the Holy Spirit have this power. In Acts, we read in chapter 6, select seven men full of the Spirit, and they chose Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen was able to inspire many, as were these other men. Nehemiah, that we'll get to later in the podcast when we consider uh, leadership, he raised the morale of Israel. He told them the God of heaven would give us success. He didn't say, we'll give you success. He said, we'll give us success. He was generous in appreciation and encouragement of others. Good job. Way to go. Look at that wall. He dealt promptly with potential causes of weakness. The people were discouraged through weariness and obstruction, and he fixed it. He directed them towards God and reorganized them to deal with their problems. The people were disillusioned through greed and heartlessness of their rich brothers. So Nehemiah took action and corrected the wrong. He exclaimed this to the people, and I leave this part of this podcast with this instruction, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And he demonstrated this joy by his own life and various trials. To be inspiring to others, if you have the first 10 of these attributes, then the inspirational power will follow. And as we submit to the Lord and to his will, we're filled with his spirit. And by being filled with his spirit, we're able to do great and mighty things. So I have eight applications focusing on the Shema. The first one is, the Lord is God. Honor and trust the Lord above all. That's in verse four. Verse five, love the Lord your God. Obey his commands. Jesus said in John 15 that we discussed together in a previous podcast um, that we love God by obeying his commandments. So 
our application is, what are the commandments that you need to obey? Number three, hold the command commandments in your heart. In other words, trust the word of God above all, especially in the hard places. Hold the commandments in your heart by trusting God and his word above everything else. Teach your children the word of God. That This means speaking. This doesn't mean simply providing opportunities or materials. It means actually opening your mouth and speaking the word and explaining it to them and allowing them to explain as well. Talk about the word of God morning, noon, and night and apply it in all situations. Tie the word of God to your hands as a sign. Memorize the word of God so that your actions will reflect it. Write the word of God on your doors and gates. Well, I think you should write the word of God on your walls. Uh, write it on your cars. Write it, uh, put it on a keychain. You know, have it on your desk. Uh, make it a very public thing. And finally, number eight, fear, worship, and follow the Lord your God alone. Resist peer pressure and resist selfishness. Well, this ends today's podcast. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for giving us statutes and judgments. Lord, help us to grow in our obedience with you. Lord, that it may be well with us that you may be glorified. Father, our desire is that Jesus would be glorified, that the fact of the greatness of the things that you have done for us and the death of your Son and giving us of your Spirit and of your Word would be known to all, that all would know what a great God you are. We pray for Pastor Andrew, Lord, that you would strengthen him in his ministry and his family and that you would be glorified in the church in Spartanburg. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Basic Training Podcast, taught by Dr. Robert Forney. This podcast is available on Spotify and the Google and Apple Podcast apps, also on the Basic Training YouTube channel. If you want to contact us with any comments or questions, please email basictrainingpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and God bless. Do you agree with me that this is the Magna Carta? Yes. Yep. Yeah, very much so. Any questions, gentlemen? Comments? Thoughts? Hey, go ahead, Chuck. Dr. Forney, going back to your point about the importance of teaching the statutes of the Lord to children who can't understand them yet, do you have any practical advice for how to lead family worship with kids of widely wide wide age range of kids? Yes, I do. Okay, I, I do. Great questions. I do. Do not underestimate the the ability of young people to pay attention. I think read, read, read. We tried to do this. Uh, my wife, Debbie, did it more than I did. I'd do it in the evening or on a Saturday morning. She did it almost every day. You read to the children. We we ourselves avoided getting the picture book Bibles, although we did have a video series that was pretty good that told different Bible stories. And and I think there's a pretty broad age range. I'm forgetting the, the name. But read the word you know, and, and discuss it. Read the stories. And I, I think uh, if you expect young children to not understand, if you expect them to be bored, they will not disappoint you. We, we have five kids. So, you know, when our youngest was, uh, was an infant, our oldest was uh, eight, I think. Anyway, and and so that's a that's a pretty good age range, and so we wouldn't wait until the youngest was asleep so we could uh, we could read to the older one. But if you read, what will happen? There's all sorts of things that will happen. They'll get some of it. They won't get as much as the older ones, but but they'll be getting something. But another thing that happens is you increase their attention span, you know, and 
one of the things that um, we did not, I, we could afford it, but I didn't buy a computer for the home until they were older. Because we understood, even with the television, how entrapping that was and how uh, that watching videos all the time would shorten an attention span because it creates the expectation that I'm constantly going to be excited and I don't have to use my imagination. Whereas when you're reading, it's the, the pictures are all in your mind. And even a small child can have these pictures constructed and will... Um, develop a love of learning. I, it was interesting. There was a, there was a man who was actually a pastor one day who told me, he said, Bob, he said, uh, you're so lucky. All your kids like to read. <laughs> you know, and I looked at him, I said, there's no luck about it. <laughs> you know, we read to them. And so that's what I'd say. I'd say, just read. Thank you. You understand your heart and how important it is? Yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think of when you met your wife, you know, and when you fell in love. You know, uh, the Lord said um, in Revelation to the church at Ephesus how they'd left their first love. You know, I think we all know what that is. The question is, you know, what happened? And, and I'll tell you what happens is we drift away from God. You know, very often it happens in times of prosperity. You know, when, when we get what we want, we forget God, and then our hearts grow cold. One of the things that I've found, you know, some of the most mundane things in my medical practice were years ago very exciting. You know, I trembled, I was anxious, I, you know— what was that? How do how do I do that? What's you know? And you go through this period, and then then you get you become more and more confident in something, right? And then it can become not that exciting, even taken for granted. Well, you know what the antidote is? Teach a young person, because now they're going to be going through the same lack of confidence and insecurity. And as we pour ourselves into others' lives, especially into younger lives, it keeps it alive in our life. Because even as we're commanded to obey the commandments, one of the commandments is that we teach our sons and our grandsons. <laughs> so that means getting involved in, in the life of someone who's a lot younger than you. And I think uh, when we fail to do that, because we're so interested in our own entertainment, that, um, that our love goes cold. I mean, it's as simple as that. Same principle we, when we get the husbands. Same principle in love and a marriage. We'll uh, we'll die in the same way. Well, thank you very much, men. I hope you have a good week. Uh, next week we're going to talk about discipline. And as I talk about discipline, I want you to know that um, discipline is both positive and negative. Uh, we we associate discipline with spanking or something, and it certainly includes that. But but I believe that discipline should be mostly positive, uh, maybe 90% positive. That is giving our sons and daughters the disciplines of life, training them how to do things. We'll talk a lot more about that. Hope to have some good examples for you, and I look forward to being with you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.